Welcome to the Prison Professors Podcast. We serve people who face challenges with prosecution, sentencing, and prison. My co-founders are Sean Hopwood and Justin Paperni. My name is Michael Santos. We create digital content and our team offers individual consulting services. We also assist agencies that want to improve outcomes. To learn how we can help you, text the word Prison Pro to 44222. Again, text Prison Pro to 44222 and get our free brochure. You can also visit us at prisonprofessors.com or contact Justin at 818 424 2220. Please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Send confirmation that you reviewed our podcast and we'll send you a free digital book. Stay tuned for a 20 to 30 minute episode of Prison Professors. Welcome to the Prison Professors Program. I am Michael Santos, and today I'm very happy to introduce you to Omari, a young man who went into the prison system and yet didn't waste his time, prepared himself in ways to come back extraordinarily successfully, and now he's helping other people do the same. We're going to listen to his story today, and I hope that you'll find some inspiration in it, just as I am finding. Omari, welcome to the Prison Professors Program. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about your background and where you grew up and what brought you into the criminal justice system? Well, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. I spent some time in Seattle, Portland, Vancouver, Tacoma. My parents were addicted to drugs. I had a lot of instability, bounced around a lot, spent a little bit of time in the foster care system. Not not a long time at all, but there were multiple stays there where we were pulled out of the house. There were quite a bit of times that we were homeless, um, dealt with some neglect, abandonment, things like that. My whole K through 12 experience in school, I was always getting kicked out of class, always getting suspended, got expelled when I was in the sixth grade and shipped out of the middle school to an alternative high school. And my values were just being really distorted by my life experiences. So I had, you know, I used to watch my parents go into grocery stores and steal batteries and cartons of cigarettes and go sell it to little smaller stores so that they can go buy drugs and stuff. So when I see this behavior, that's, that becomes normal to me. So I, I learned if I wanted something, I, sh- I should just take it. So I started stealing clothes, running out of Nike town in downtown Seattle with sh- brand new shoes and stuff, you know, and not really caring. I, I was real bold and I felt like I did this stuff because I had to. I wanted to have nice things. I wanted to, you know, not be made fun of if I went to school because I got on the same clothes I've had for a few years. So so did that lead to you having any challenges with the criminal justice system as a juvenile? I, had, I got caught stealing a couple times. Um, the most that ever came from that, I think I did like cleaning the side of the roads one time. But besides that, nothing too major. Um, and how far, did you, how far did you go in school as a young boy? I went through the ninth grade till like probably the last couple months and I stopped going. After that, I was enrolled in a lot of schools, but there was never any effort and it didn't really last too long. So I'll say I probably, I probably have like an eighth grade education before college. Did you have any idea of what you would be doing with your future? I mean, that was a very difficult background, a lot of trauma in it, it sounds like, and didn't really put you on a pathway for the successful life that you're leading now. Just curious, what, as a young boy, while you were going through that, did you have any aspirations of what you'd like to do as an adult? No, nah, my aspirations really came from the people I was hanging with, my cousins. And um, I was always the youngest one. They were a little bit older, so they started doing these things a little, you know, a little sooner than me. And then I'd see them do it, and I just wanted to do what they were doing because they were the people I looked up to. I aspired to be like my big cousins. Did they really... have challenges with the criminal justice system as well, like your parents? Um, not, not as, not when we were kids, they didn't really have it, but as adults, they've been to jail, um, like a couple of them in and out constantly. So did you have any thoughts that, that jail or prison one way or the other of, of how it would influence your life? Or did you expect always that you'd serve some time? I kind of knew, I mean, because of my life, it was always about crime. I didn't have too many people in my life who worked a job, who just woke up and lived a positive, productive life. And almost everybody I knew who was older had been to jail before. So it was just an expectation. I never knew what I'd end up going for. And even when I did go, like, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. When I was out there committing the crimes that led me to prison, I had no idea the extent of it. I didn't realize what I, you know, what I was really doing. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about the crimes that that led you into prison? So I I went to prison for a bank fraud scheme. I was charged with 30 30 felony convictions in total. Their um, identity theft was the highest one, which carries a maximum of 84 months. I had theft one, theft two, conspiracy to commit these crimes, forgery. Um, 
what they really wanted to get me with was leading organized crime. They wanted to get you know, like 15 years in prison, but they weren't able to do that. So I pled guilty as charged to all 30 felonies I was charged with. And my lawyer fought for me in court to get me a drug offender sentencing alternative. Even though I didn't have a problem with drugs, he was able to successfully get me half of my t- with, with DOSA in the state of Washington, you get half of your mid-range. So with identity theft carrying a maximum of 84 months, I lucked out. Like, I went from where these people wanted to give me 15 years to I got 36 months, you know, and had to spend another 36 on probation afterwards. So, When you got arrested, did they keep you locked up in pretrial detention while you were having to make these decisions in jail, or did they let you out on bond? I hired a lawyer before, like, I didn't just get arrested on the street and caught up or anything. I turned myself in. I found out I had warrants for my arrest. I hired a lawyer and I turned myself in because I was actually done with this stuff at the time. I was like, you know, I'm trying to move on with my life. I had moved to Portland, enrolled at Portland Community College and was looking forward to getting started. And I found out that I had this warrant, you know, and I had to um, address that I didn't want to live my life looking over my shoulder. So I went to the lawyer. He, this was my, I never had been, I had never spent time in jail before, before this. Um, I was, how old was I? This was 2006. I was, no, 2004. So I was 19 years old when I turned myself in. So that's interesting. You said that you, you grew up without many positive influences in your life. But then you said that you, you'd kind of changed and you were in, enrolled in a community college. What made that shift? What, what caused you to want to change it to uh, go back to school and, and change your life? Well, I knew I had to do something different. This wasn't the first time I tried going to school. Um, while I was still in the midst of my criminal run, I had a friend who was going to college in Hutchinson, Kansas, a community college, and I actually went with him. And I thought that I was going to be able to stay there. My tuition would be taken care of, but my tuition wasn't paid. So I had to come back to Seattle and I went right back to my life of crime. But um, at this time, people, it made the, the, the crime that I was committing it was widespread in this area. I'm talking about, you talk to any young black man my age, he is at least in this area, he was at least approached about committing the crimes that I was committing. It what was, was that, the crime? You, what I would do is I would get, find someone with a bank account, get their ATM card for them, like pay them for it, and then find someone else with a bank account, pay them for their checks, write the check, combine them together, and then somehow the banks would clear the money even if it was not there. So it was a pretty simple scheme. Everybody, you know, a lot of people were painted as victims who were really accomplices. And for the same reason I make money, considered victims, even though I paid them. Whoa. I just, I just got a message that says my connection is unstable. Are we good? Yeah, I think it's okay. I think what we should do to make it better is stop, stop doing the video. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to block the video on my end and you block the video on your end. And that way our uh, – block the video on your end. Just put the little camera over – yeah. I think we'll have better internet that way. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So you were telling me that when you were 19 or so, you had this shift and you decided to go back to school after you were involved in this bank fraud scheme. It was just because you had an idea that you wanted to do something else, why the bank fraud scheme wasn't working out so well? Well, I, I knew it wasn't going to last forever. And people, it, like, it made the news. Was, it was really widespread. And people who I knew started making the news, getting arrested, having their door kicked in by the police and, you know, losing everything. I'm like, I'm not about to be the next one. So when I saw that on the news, that's what made me move to Portland, move out of town. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be next. I didn't, I didn't know if they were after me or anything like that. But I was like, I'm done from that, from the last – Moved from Puyallup in um, December 2005, and I was done with it when I moved from there. And then you found out that you had a warrant for your arrest. You turned your, you went to see a lawyer, and you turned yourself in. Were you ever mm-hmm. taken into pretrial, or did you were were you able to resolve all your judicial matters before sentencing? No, I, I spent the them. day the day I turned myself in. I thought I was I had action at walking out of that courtroom. But instead, what happened was, even though I turned myself in, the prosecutor was painting this picture of me as some flight risk, even though I was there willingly, walked in, didn't have to get forced in. I was there willingly, but they labeled me a flight risk and gave me a $100,000 bail, and I was stuck in the county jail for eight and a half months. 
And while you were stuck in the county jail, is that when you were thinking in your mind you might be getting or the government was trying to give you 15 years? My lawyer told me that I was looking at decades in prison and I didn't understand why he was telling me that. So what I did was I, um, I contacted the law library and got all the sentencing guidelines and looked up for myself exactly what I was looking at. And I, I presented it to him. I told him, like, this doesn't make sense to me. I, my highest charge is identity theft one. This carries seven years maximum. Why are you telling me I'm looking at decades in prison? And it was, the, it was that they were trying to get me for leading organized crime. There were, there were a lot of people who were in jail for the charges I was in there for, and they ended up with a lot more charges as time went on. It's like they were, they were still investigating, still digging, and trying to cook us, really. They were trying to make examples out of a few people, um, you know, because I said it was so widespread. If you make examples out of people, then maybe you'll scare these other people away. But little do they know, here it is, 2018, and I'm sure this stuff's still going on. <laughs> did you have some idea while you were sitting in jail of what you would be doing while, when you eventually went into the prison system? No, I had no idea. I mean, this was my first time ever as a 19. I had never been inside of these jails before. I was just trying to adjust. You know, I didn't know what to expect. I was there for an indefinite amount of time. I didn't know, um, like, my bail was so astronomical. I knew I wasn't getting out. So I was just trying to get used to it. I was like, man, I'm going to be here for a while. There, were, there was someone else who I knew who um, had the same type of charges, and he was arrested about 11 months before me, and he was still in there fighting his case. You know, so I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm look, I might as well look forward to a long stay in here. So I just I knew it would be long. I didn't know what else to expect. And the ultimate sentence turned out to be how many years? It was 36 months. The way they do it with DOSA is you do half um, of your time as a prison sentence and half on community correction. So I had 36 months prison time, and then I had 36 months of probation. Tell us about what you did while you were in prison. When I was in prison, well, when I was in the, when, in the, in the county jail, I just played cards all day and sat there miserable and stuff. But in, once I got to prison, I actually, you know, I, things just started really looking up for me a little bit. I was able to do a little bit more. Um, going outside was real good for me. And, and that was just at receiving, you know, before I was really doing any programming or anything. But once I got to Larch, which is where I served my time, they put me in this program called Integrity, which is for people who have drug problems and they are court ordered to do um, treatment. So when I got into integrity, even though I didn't have, I was in there for a cocaine addiction. I've never done cocaine a day in my life, but this forced me to look at my life and my behaviors and you know what I wanted to do when I got out. So as much as I hated the idea of having to go into that program, I really do think that it was a real positive uh, thing for me as far as looking at the future. When I got out, I wouldn't say that I really applied a lot of the stuff, but my mindset, it still had an impact. How old were you when you got out of prison? I got out in 2008. I was 23 years old. And now you're 32 years old. You're pursuing a master's degree and teaching others. Uh, this, this does not, this isn't adding up. I said I was 19. I, I must have been, I was 20. I was 20. Wait, no, I was 21 when I went in, not 19. I'm sorry, I misspoke about that. I was 21, and I got out when I was 23. So you got out when you were 23, yeah. and you now are very different from that man who went into the prison system. You're a college graduate pursuing graduate school and teaching other formerly incarcerated people how to get into the university. Tell us a little bit about that transition from being a formerly incarcerated person, coming back to society, and building yourself into a leadership role in society. How did that, how did you make that transition? Like when, when it's said like that, you know, like, oh, I went to prison and I got out and now I'm doing this stuff. Like it, sound, it sounds like it was just, you know, a smooth transition when it's said, but it was rough, man. I, I have been struggling since I walked out that gate in 2008. I, when I, 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 I didn't mention the part about my kid's mother being my co-defendant. So when I got out, I, I served all of my time. Even though she was my co-defendant, I served all of my time and went through my whole court process and was released, and she was still going to court. When I got out, I got out in June. In September, I was starting college, and she had to go serve her time. So when I started college, just months after my release, I be, also became a single father of two children. 
one one of those children was not even biologically mine. And it was it was a struggle, you know, to stay motivated to succeed because I'm poor, you know. So it it took a lot of major blessings. Like I was living with with her mom and I was super uncomfortable. And then, bam, here's this blessing. I got a two bedroom for me and the kids to live in. And I only have to pay 30 percent of my income, which is nothing because it's coming from DSHS. And since I was getting since I was getting cash from DSHS, I had to um, participate in work first activities. So since I'm in work first, they want they don't want me pursuing a college degree. I can't. They don't want me to get my associates. They want me to do something that's going to be short term training and going to lead directly to employment. But I had to fight against that, you know. And it was was really discouraging, you know, because these guys are helping take care of me, helping me feed my family. But I know I don't I don't want to do a short term training. I want I want a real education that's going to you know, take some real, some years, not, not to, not to discount short-term training, but it wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to get a college degree, you know, and that's what I did. I fought against it. And, you know, during this time, after I graduated from Pierce college, I got my associates in alcoholism and drug abuse. I was going to be, a, that's a, I got to say, Amari, that's a really uh, mature and, and fundamentally different mindset that when you went in, because earlier, it sounds like you were living pretty much for immediate gratification and just taking whatever could come today without thinking about how it would influence your life tomorrow. And now you're, you're telling us that you shifted your mindset completely and said, I want to focus on a long-term career and really changing my life. And you invested yourself, it sounds like a hundred percent commitment to doing that. What do you yeah. think influenced you to want to have, to have that mindset, mind shift change? I would say, I would say a lot of it was just put in me. I'm, I'm a strong believer in God. Everything that I do, I feel like it's put in me by God. Like people always ask me, what was it? Was there someone there who helped redirect you? Was it any, you know, they try to, they try to pinpoint that moment where I made the decision that I'm going to go the right way. And it's hard for me to, cause I, I, it's it almost like I have to make something up, you know, but cause it's, it's just in me, you know, it was just, it was, instilled in me I'm a strong believer to do positive things and I feel like as long as I'm putting positive energy into the world that's what's going to come right back to me and my path is being directed to that I've never had a mentor I didn't have any type of um you know a lot a lot of people who who share similar stories they've had a guide you know someone who helped walk them down this path and I've just been I've been led by God you know and I don't know if you believe in God and a lot of people is going to sound corny to if you don't but I that's the only way that I can explain it. Well, I definitely believe in God and I also believe in mentors. And I think that you're right now, just by sharing your story, could be one kind of way of mentoring other people who are going through struggle. I know that I'm learn, learning something from you and I hope that other people are as well. And that is that in order to become successful, you've got to start sh changing your mind or the way that you look at life. And you've got to start making a commitment to saying, I know I've got to invest in myself because if I invest in myself, new opportunities are going to come. And as you said, it's not easy. It was yeah, enormously right. difficult. It only looks easy now, 10 years later when you're a college graduate, but I have no doubt it was difficult and you went through a lot of struggle when you came out of prison and made that transition to the college. I'd love you to elaborate a little bit more on about what those struggles looked like and how you were able to find the strength to overcome them. The biggest, the biggest struggle that I faced during my time in college, like when I, when I was about to graduate with my associate's degree, up to that point, I had never dealt with, uh, as an adult, I never had anyone close to me who had passed away. I never had to deal with like planning funerals and things like that. But my stepdad passed away right before I graduated with my associate's degree. And that was like, it took a major toll on my whole family because we were all poor. We, we can't afford funerals. We, he didn't have any life insurance. So that was, took a major toll on me right there. But I still pushed through and finished my degree. Once I got to UW Tacoma, um, starting my bachelor's degree, my mom passed away my first quarter there. And I still kept pushing. You know, I didn't stop. I didn't take any breaks. I refused to let you know, the death of my loved ones be the reason that I'm going to fail. Cause I know if they're looking down, they would, they would hate that. You know, they would hate to know that their lifestyle choices and the fact that they had an early death led to me choosing to fail and stop my success. Shortly after my mom passed away, 
Well, my mom passed away in 2012. I graduated with my bachelor's in 2014. I started grad school that year. My first quarter of grad school, my biological dad died. This was at the very beginning, but I still, I had a job interview in the financial aid office the day I found out he died. I had a class and a meeting. I was at all, no, I didn't go to all. I went to the job interview and I went to the meeting and my professor, Dr. Ignacio, she told me, don't come to class. I better not see you in class. But I kept pushing. While I'm getting towards the finish line, finishing my master's project, my big sister passed away. So my, my biggest struggle has been to keep pushing, you know, despite losing four of the closest people to me in the world. It sounds like you're, you're a big believer of God. It sounds a lot like the trials that we, that we read about in the book of Job, that it, regardless of how much, you know, uh, you keep pushing forward, there just keeps being more loss. And it's a real credit to you that you found the strength to get through and, and stick through uh, your studies and, and get these degrees that are so impressive to so many people right now. How, what, when you were doing that, Amari, tell us a little bit about what your ultimate ambitions were. Why were you going to school? What did you want to do? What did you, how did you want to apply what you were learning to the career that you wanted to build? I didn't know. I had, I had no idea. I, was, I felt so limited. You know, I um, had 30 felonies on my record. I had no work experience. I, my, first, my, my employment history consisted of like my work study jobs that I had on campus. And I felt like my, when I look at my classmates, you know, to the left and to the right of me, I'm like, they can do whatever they want. If they, if they pick a degree program and they're able to excel, they can go get a career in that field. If, they're, if they have ambition and they have drive, they can make it happen. But I felt like, for me, I honestly felt like I was getting an education just to get it and then I'd figure it out. I, I had, when I, when I was getting my bachelor, when I was getting my associates, I wanted to be a CDP. But once I learned about the possibility to transfer, I just, I was like, look, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to get the degree. You know, I didn't, I didn't have a certain career. I graduated with my bachelor's with no plan. I hadn't applied to grad school yet. I hadn't applied for any jobs. I had a professor who um, had reached out to me who wanted to help me out. We were looking at the social work master's program. I was discouraged. I was told, um, nah, you're not going to be a good fit. You're not going to be able to find an internship um, because of your, criminal convictions that are permanently disqualifying from DSHS standards or whatever. So eventually I just, I applied to the master of arts and interdisciplinary studies program. And even when I entered grad school, I wrote in my personal statement, I have no idea what I want to do. I, I was like, I hope through this program, I can figure that, that out. And I had no idea what I wanted to research. I Initially, I was going to do my research on the educational impacts for kids who are served in low income public housing. And it just, I, I, it, it, it was a good topic, but I just wasn't fully in it. And eventually I decided to start looking at myself, you know, looking at my life and looking at what do I really have to give the world? What's really, um, what, what, what's special about me that might be able to impact others if they knew, if, you know, what, what can I share about myself with the world? So I, I decided I was going to do my research on, um, how post-secondary education can reduce the risk for recidivism. I was like, you know, I stayed free. I haven't went back to prison and education's played a major role in that. So let me, let me research, you know, the impact that education can have on other, on other people. And I designed a workshop called progression to help people go from prison to college as my master's project. And from there, it just led me like when I got my job at South Seattle college, I just, I met the right person. I didn't put in an application I, or I, I hardly, you know, freaking interviewed. <laughs> I just, I met, I met the right people and, you know, they saw something in me and gave me an opportunity. How did you meet this person that opened the opportunity for you? I, I signed a contract with Tacoma Community College um, to offer my workshop there. And just through spreading the word about the workshop, a lot of people heard about it and were reaching out to me, wanting to set up meetings and things like that. And I had met a guy named Hector Ortiz and, you know, he's been, he's been a real major asset to me, a major blessing, you know, um, 
and he, he just introduced me to the right people who he knew, and I was able to get the job working at South. You know, the, the, the message that I receive in that is that you've been investing in yourself for, well, it sounds like almost a decade learning to change your mind in the beginning. Then people started to recognize how hard you were working and new opportunities open. Those people had to, give, had to believe in you in order to let you uh, graduate from the community college and then enroll in the University of Washington and then graduate from the University of Washington and then go on even after you graduated into a graduate program and find employment in the field that you have been studying. All of that I think reflects on your good character and the way that people can see, even though you've made some bad decisions in the past, you can overcome them. What do you see in your future now that you've, that you've done this, that you've gone through graduate school? Have you finished yet? Did you get your master's degree yet? Yeah, I got my master's last December. Congratulations. And I started my job in March, so it, it didn't take long at all. It's like, that's why I say only God, like, I hear so much about college graduates who can't find a job, period. And I just, I mean, look how it happened for me. I, this is not, I, that's another thing that I have to, when I speak about my story, I have to caution people that, look, don't expect that everything's going to happen. Like, I, I lucked into housing. I lucked into a job, stuff like that. It's not going to always fall into your lap like that. But as long as you're putting positive out there, it might take some no's, but eventually that yes is going to come. Just you be persistent. Don't, don't look at my experience and discourage yourself. Don't use me as your measuring stick. Just find your own inspiration and keep pushing. You know, there's an old, there's an old adage that says the harder we work, the luckier we get. And it, you may call it luck. But the reality is, as you said, opportunities kept opening. They kept opening because you kept investing in yourself and you made that solid decision to avoid criminal activity and focus on, on contributing in positive ways. And so new opportunities opened for you. And yeah. as I said, I think that you're a mentor for some of the people who are living in struggle right now that need to find out and need to hear messages just like yours that show you can go through a lot of struggle. There's always going to be more struggle. And despite those struggles that keep coming from many different uh, areas of our life, even the, the loss of, of loved ones, we can still be persistent. We can still focus on success. And if we do that, good things are going to happen to us. Um, Omar, we've come to the end of this episode. I'm wondering if you might have some last words that you would like to share to listeners of the Prison Professors podcast who want to hear and learn a little bit more from you. Any final words for them? Well, I did, I did write a book about my experiences. It's called Transforming Society's Failure. It's available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble websites. Um, it's also available at amariamilly.com. It's getting pretty good reviews. I'd love some support if, if people want to check that out, if you want to hear more about my story. I want to hear again the title of your book, Transforming? Transforming Society's Failure. Society's failure and the author is your your full name on the as the author is it for me for Lima Amili or is it Omar? Tell us your the author's name. Omari Amili. By Omari Amili and it's available where? Amazon, Barnes and Noble, pretty much all the major online retailers, and also omariamili.com. Omariamili.com. I will certainly put that in the show notes so that more people can find out more about your inspiring story because I think that people who are living in struggle need to learn from individuals just like you. Appreciate it. I want to thank you for taking this time on a Saturday morning to share your story with listeners of the Prison Professors podcast. And I will be presenting show notes at prisonprofessors.com that link directly back to amariamili.com. And I encourage others to, to buy his book, Transforming Society's Failure by Omari Amili. Uh, he is the, uh, the exact type of person that we try to profile here, showing that regardless of what challenges an individual has faced in the past, that person can become successful. And if you'd like more information on what we do and how we strive to serve people going through the criminal justice system, visit us at prisonprofessors.com or send a text that says prison pro to 44222 that's text prison pro to 44222 i am michael santos with prison professors we'll be back tomorrow with another inspiring guest thank you